Uh, then in 1981, you may recall, we had two major bills. One was the graham latta bill passed in May of 81. That was the so-called budget cut bill. And I'll tell you, after that was passed, we read in the news media, we saw in the news media these shrieks and horrors about how people were going to be dying in the streets due to this drastic meat axe approach of cutting the budget. And I had letters, petitions, delegations, one after another saying, look, I know we need to get an economic house in order, but don't cut my program. It was a daily routine in Washington. One group after another said, you're right, we need to balance the budget. You're right, we need to restore fiscal sanity, but don't cut my program. Well, you can relax, because after the Graham Latta, the so-called budget cut bill, we actually did not cut the budget. That was a bit of the media sleight of hand. What we did cut was the planned increase in the budget. Under the Carter proposal, the increase would have been this much, but instead, the increase was only this much. But that was listed as a budget cut. The second major bill of 1981 was the hans Conable bill, which was the tax cut bill. And once again, that was presented by the media and some so-called economists as being a bill that was going to grossly destabilize the American society because we were dramatically cutting taxes, causing a giant increase in the deficit. But after the tax cut bill, actually, taxes went up, not down. Now, what did happen is they simply did not go up as much as had been planned during the Carter administration. So what we had was a reduction in the planned increase in taxes. But when you figure bracket creep due to inflation and you figure increases in taxes due to Social Security tax increases, the typical American was paying more in taxes, not less, after we passed the so-called tax cut bill. Then, in August of 1982, this was the end of supply-side economics. We passed the giant tax increase that had the backing of Senator Dole, Senator Kennedy, Tip O'Neill, and the White House. We then passed another giant tax increase of the 5% gasoline tax, tax on tires, and so forth. So we have seen the greatest tax increase during a period when Americans were being promised that there were going to be tax decreases. The window of vulnerability defensive-wise, in the terms of our national defense, is continuing to open. Our danger is increasing. It is not increasing at as much of a rate as it had been in the prior administration. We had promises of uh, reducing areas of federal spending, uh, but certainly in the areas of foreign aid, the expenditures have increased. We've increased our participation in payments to the International Monetary Fund, to foreign aid. We have bailed out the banks that loaned Poland bad loans, and you're now going to bail out additional banks coming up very soon through another giant payment to the International Monetary Fund we paid for by your taxes. Now, it will be said, that this will not contribute to the budget deficit. Technically, that is correct, because it's not going to come out of that segment of what we term the budget. But still, it'll be money taken out of our society by the federal government borrowing from the capital markets, meaning that about $9 billion will be going out that otherwise would have been available for American prosperity. And that will be going to countries that borrowed money from, from uh, banks, and they cannot pay back, and the real beneficiaries will be the giant banking concerns. In other words, if the banks make good loans and make money, they benefit. When the banks make bad loans, they are not hurt because the taxpayers are brought in to subsidize the bad loans. And what we're really doing is bailing out the banks that have made this enormous amount of bad loans that cannot now be repaid. Now, there are various possibilities. We're continuing to fund the left. About 10,000 different organizations, many of you see Jesse Jackson on television screaming about what we need to do of racism in America. <clears throat> His group gets about 600,000, a little over $600,000 a year of U.S. tax money. And we have about 10,000 organizations like this that you assume are legitimate organizations. For example, the National Social Workers Association. 
That's receiving taxpayers' money from various departments in Washington. In their recent convention, they stood up and urged social workers to have their patients, uh, people who are having psychiatric help, urge them to get active in the nuclear freeze movement and demonstrations as a means of mental therapy. Well, the average American said, well, if a social workers group wishes to advocate, that's their business. Well, I agree, that's their business if they wish to do that. But why should I be thrown down, my wallet taken out, money taken out of my wallet, to subsidize people who are that, in that type of political arena? And yet we're doing that. We're doing that, as I say, in about 10,000 organizations. Now, the questions that are plaguing us is, how can this be? Because these policies are being done in contradiction to what we were told. One policy is that Mr. Reagan perhaps is not too bright and he's surrounded by a bad staff and a bad cabinet. Number two possibility is that Mr. Reagan came to Washington understanding the right things, uh, but once there is understood where the power is in Washington and that the power is from the left, dominates the labor unions, dominates the establishment, dominates the lobbyists, dominates the news media, and that when you try to do the right thing in Washington, it seems like no one back home really cares. And so all of the awards, all of the accolades are coming from the left. And so therefore, unless I think there's an incredible amount of strength based upon principles, the typical response is, why fight it? Give in to it, because most people back home don't know and don't care. Uh, they read their news media. They accept the media-stimulated conventional wisdom and they assume that that is what's really happened. The third possibility that some people entertain that perhaps Mr. Reagan was never really a conservative and that he really planned all along to go in this direction. It's a difficult thing to discuss, but the liberal Democrats in Washington, let me say, or the liberal Republicans, are ecstatic over the trend that has now been set forth, particularly since the elections of November 1982 because all of this is being done under the name of a conservative leadership. And yet the principles of more government, more spending, more control, these principles are continuing. And make no mistake about it, the president is saddled with a very bad Congress. What was a slightly improved Congress as the result of November of 1980 slid back as the result of the elections of November 1982. So many Americans, confused by the economic situation in America, went to the polls in November of 1982, and in so many instances, in the tight marginal races, voted out those who stood more closer to the constitutional restraints upon government, voted them out, and voted in those who said, look, I can solve your problems. If you don't have a job, if you're economically impinged, vote for me, and I'll work to restore your subsidies. I'll work to restore your grants. And the left organizations, very well healed and financed, particularly at the local level, were effective at creating a tremendous shift in the off-presidential races of 1982. The November races, I thought, were a disaster. We lost many good people. Now, <clears throat> what we needed in 1981 and 82 from the White House was a dynamic leader like FDR. By this I mean, we needed someone who could speak directly to the American people. You may not like FDR. You may not have liked Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But you have to admit that he was a real magician when it, came, when it was in the arena of talking to people. We moved into the New Deal stimulated by FDR's over 50 fireside chats in, on the radio. He was a masterful speaker. And he used the radio, the medium of the radio, uh, to the hill. He was a, a dynamic leader. And in 1934, he was able to get the New Deal advocates to be the winners in the 34 elections. And how did he do it? He did two things. In the depths of the Depression, there were more people out of work in 34 than there were in 32. Normally, you would think, well, gosh, we would have rejected those unsound policies that we had just started. Instead, Roosevelt came on the radio and gave the people hope. And number two, he created an enemy. The enemy, uh, the enemy was the greedy robber baron. That's uh, the enemies of our society. And uh, therefore, it's the greed of the wealthy few that have created the problems of the depression. And this is the group that must be rooted out. It was great demagoguery 
It was not the cause of the economic problems, but it was real good for getting your crowd elected. We came into November of 19, November, November 1982 with, with many segments of our society not having hope and also with no enemy being created. The enemy, very clearly, was the radical left elements in the Congress, some Republicans and Democrats. And it was important that the American people should have gone to the polls knowing clearly who were their friends and who were their enemies. That point of delineation was never made, tragically. I felt that Ronald Reagan has an equal ability to FDR on the television. And had he come before television, and had he come before the American people on a repetitive basis, explaining to them why we're in the economic mess, explaining to them many segments of why we are where we are, uh, under the basis, just as Roosevelt did, that he's doing this to uh, explain his new policies. Actually, it was political propaganda, but he said, well, I'm doing it to explain my policies. And it was very effective. Reagan could have used the same approach. And I felt that he was not adequately used in bypassing the media and speaking directly to the American public. Move quickly into some of the areas of uh, the fact that today in our foreign policy, we find ourselves increasingly dominated by the internationalist uh, powerful financial interest, the large banking interest. We've seen that in the case of bailing out of Poland. We're now seeing in the case of bailing out of Mexico. And many of the problems in El Salvador uh, that we're speaking of the communist uh, armed warfare. During the Carter administration, we imposed severe socialistic principles upon El Salvador, principles that have caused the capital of the country to flee. Uh, the land seizure, uh, nationalization of banks, nationalization of, of foreign uh, exchange controls and so forth has resulted in refugees leaving the country and has resulted in capital leaving the country, making it very difficult to be able to bring economic stability and prosperity back to that, uh, back to that land. In the area of our national defense, some steps are being taken to try to reverse uh, the disasters of the last 20 years that began actively with the Secretary of Defense of Robert McNamara during the Kennedy and Johnson era, but we're still operating under the McNamara scheme in the Department of Defense. And unfortunately, that is not being reversed, and we are only making uh, limited moves in this area. We are not building a single weapon system at an efficient rate of production which means that you, the taxpayers, are spending higher amounts per unit cost uh, because of what would be termed budgetary reasons. I'd like to move quickly in what we would term the areas of solution. Joseph Demetri said 200 years ago, except he said in French, that you get the kind of government you deserve. And the key to change in our society, if you do not like what is happening, if you do not like this failure to make a third transition. We came very close, it looked like in the early 1980s, to reversing this and moving more towards the midpoint of the pol political spectrum and back to traditional values. But with the election November of 1982, I would say that this thrust has now been destroyed. And I think our last best chance for doing that will be the congressional races of November 1984. And I honestly am not overly optimistic about that taking place, but I think it is vital that we do that. Now, if you do not like these trends, if you're concerned about so many of the changes that have taken place in your lifetime, being realist, you should admit, you should recognize that the key to change is Washington. And Washington is divided into three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and judicial. Now, of those three branches, you have the executive branch of government. And it comes up for the election of the president and the cabinet, actually just the president, he chooses the cabinet, once every four years. So if you're concerned in this area you can really only be involved once every four years. And uh, this appeals to a lot of Americans. 
uh, because anybody can put a bumper sticker on for two weeks once every four years. Requires very little knowledge, very little true commitment to good government. It is socially acceptable. Your car looks properly dressed. Not overdressed, just dressed. And then after the election, you can take it off and go back to whatever you were doing until the next four years. That's why I think it is so popular, because it requires very little knowledge, very little initiative. But the problem in the executive branch is that you elect the president, he chooses the cabinet, but the executive branch is about 98% of the federal government, but includes the giant bureaucracy that has now become the new government. It includes the HEW, the Human Services and Education, it includes uh, HUD, it includes the Pentagon, it includes that vast areas of Washington that now make up 98% in numerical figures of the federal government. And unfortunately, those areas are not elected. And they can only be changed if you have a succession of solid good people in the White House and a sound Senate. Now, the second level of government is the judicial branch of government. You may be absolutely frustrated with the Supreme Court. You may be fed up with some of the court decisions coming out at the federal level. But no amount of energy and no amount of money is going to be able to reverse the problems at the federal judiciary uh, because they do not stand elections. The only way you're going to reverse this is by having a good Senate that is going to be able to reject uh, nominations or a good Congress that will move towards impeachments or restriction of the authority of the Supreme Court. Now, we have that listed in the Constitution. The Congress has that opportunity, according to the Constitution, we simply have not exercised that authority, the limitation of the appellate jurisdiction. But the key to throttling a runaway judiciary is the third step, the legislative branch of government. The Senate comes up for elections every six years. One third of the Senate is up for elections every two years. And every member of the House, all 435, are up for election every two years. And this is the route of the counterattack to the long road back. And this is the message I think you need to get to your friends and neighbors, many of whom are discouraged, many of whom feel like it doesn't matter, it's hopeless. What they're really saying is that they do not have the personal interest, the discipline, to really do anything about it. That's what they're really saying. They excuse that with a social cliche of it doesn't do any good. It means that they're not willing to make the effort, take the time to make a change. But the legislative branch is the key. Now the legislative, is divided into the House and Senate. <clears throat> now the key of the two is the House, in my opinion because all the spending programs are, are controlled and originated by the House. And you can have a Genghis Khan as a president, but if you have a good House, that president is not going anyplace. He may create a wild, unconstitutional agency, but uh, a Supreme Court may say, Mr. President, that's fine with us. We agree with it. It may be outrageously unconstitutional. But a good house will say, no, we will give you no money, no money for a building, no money for secretaries, no money for typewriters, no money to carry out this program. And so you can stop a runaway government by controlling the type of individuals that you send to the House of Representatives. To a lesser degree, the Senate is important. But the Senate races are very tough because frequently they can be manipulated by the national news media. The national news media may hype up a particular Senate race and cause the uninformed or the apathetic to go a particular direction, thinking that that's the patriotic way to go because the media has taken them down the alley that if you're really concerned, that's the right step. This man, not this person, uh, is the way to go. And, uh, but at the House races, the national media does not have a stranglehold. And this is why I think the opportunities are especially for Americans every two years. Now, I jokingly say that I think dumb people worry about presidential races 
well informed people are active and concerned about the legislative races particularly the house races every two years now i'll give you just a thumbnail sketch and it is subjective it's difficult to make an objective presentation of the makeup of the house of representatives and let me do it using the last congress because i think the last congress is a little bit easier since this time the picture is worse i'll say that if that makes you feel better the house is divided into three groups now there are 435 members now if you judge members of the house by their speeches they pretty much all sound the same if you're going to judge them by what they say when they come to a rotary club or when do they go to the Kiwanis Club? Or if you're going to judge them by how they look at a 4th of July speech, uh, they all will say one or two jokes and give phrases suggestive of traditional values. If, however, you throw the speeches out, which you should do, and instead judge your representatives in the House of Representatives based upon their records, then three separate basic patterns emerge. One, two of the camps are ideological, guided by ideological values. One camp is non-ideological. I would say in the House of Representatives, in the last Congress, you had about 85 or 90 who are dedicated to the values of developing a totalitarian socialist society. Now, some of them believe the way to get there is by revolution, violence, burn the system down, and upon the ashes we will create this new order of a centralized society controlling segments of, of the individual activity. Most of them, however, are not revolutionaries, but this objective by evolution rather than revolution. They would be the Fabian school, the second group. But taken together, whether by evolution or revolution, you have a block of about 85 or 90 members. I would say in the last Congress you had maybe 40 or 45 members that are working to restore traditional values, working to restore a limited government, free enterprise, and a society and laws based upon our biblical heritage. Not to say that we're going to impose the Bible as the law. No, the Constitution is the law. But I would say you have about 40 or 45. These are individuals that, frankly, if you're going to uh, go on a fishing trip, if you're going to play golf, if you're going to have a weekend off at some uh, vacation spot, you want to go with one of this group. They are delightful people to be with. If you are sad, they will be sad. If you are crying, they will cry. If you are telling jokes, they will tell you one joke for every joke you tell. They reflect whatever environment they're in. They are, by nature of their personalities, self-promoters. As I say, they're not good, they're not bad, for them, it's the best job they've ever had, and they want to keep it. <clears throat> and uh, you can look at their voting records, and on a principle of economics, or a principle of government, on February, they vote yes. In April, they vote no. June, they vote yes. August, they vote no. October, they vote yes. And you go up to them and say, George, what in the world are you doing? You're tearing your hair out. <clears throat> and you say, look, the principle was the same, but you flopped all over the place. How can this be? And George, if he's honest, and most of them probably, if you want it one-to-one, -one, are fairly honest, they will say, well, that's the way it appeared to me that day. Based upon all the antenna, based upon what they sifted in from their mail, from calls, discussions, last-minute uh, tips on the House floor, that's what it appeared to get reelected that day. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, you say, that's pretty grim. Well, not really. It, it's grim. But it's not hopeful. In my mind's eye, I view it like a giant horseshoe magnet that we used to play with as a, as a child. On one pole, on the left, you have about uh, 85 or 90 units of magnetic pull. On the other side, you have about 40 or 45 units of magnetic pull. And... If we place a sheet on top of the magnet and we sprinkle out 300 to 315 iron filings, 
they will clump out on the magnetic lines of force. And everything else being equal, the clumping will go in this direction. Now, I want you to know what happened after the November 1982 elections, 1980 elections. After November of 1980, the news media lost control of the issues, incidentally, in the fall of 1980. And they could not, they lost control, they could not frame the issues, and other groups were able to control the issues, and resulted in so many of those who had pushed for America's leftward surge were defeated in the House, and especially the Senate. That was the big news of 1980. Now, after that, the alignment after that was one I've just given you, and not really very exciting. However, the public had perceived that a giant shift had taken place, and many of these members, the 300 and, right here, the 300, 315 iron filings, boy, they had gotten the message that a shift had taken place in the American public. And we better wake up. And I had so many of my colleagues, I was astounded. There were individuals who had voted for one wild spending program after another in recent years. Suddenly, one after another, they were sponsoring bills demanding and requiring a balanced budget. You had the feeling that they had written the, the American Constitution. They were making speeches and their newsletters back home were presentations that I would have been proud to have signed. They were great. And I just couldn't believe my eyes in some of the cases of these individuals that were now presenting themselves, wrapping themselves in the cloak of the Constitution and of fiscal sanity. And remember, you saw the development of the Democratic Party of the so-called Boll Weevils. The Boll Weevils were about 45 members of the Democratic Party who were, quote, in rebellion to the leftward surge. Now, the leadership of the Bull Weevil movement made a giant mistake, in my opinion, because only 20 or 25 of the 45 could remotely be called conservative by their voting records. The other 20 or 25 were from conservative Democratic districts that were scared to death that they were going to lose their elections in the upcoming November 82 election. So they went along and joined the group to be able to write back home about what a tough stand they were doing. They were going to support the White House and all this type of stuff. They were in rebellion to Tip O'Neill, that dirty old bum from Massachusetts. <laughs> well, <clears throat> after we passed the so-called tax cut bill and the budget cut bill and the media began to confuse the American public, I could tell that by January of 82, the American public had lost the message. In my town hall meetings, no one spoke up for when are you going to balance the budget. No one said, when are we going to restore soundness to the dollar? You had more and more people saying, I'm worried about my job, I'm worried about my subsidies, I'm worried about my cuts. Don't overcut, don't overdo. That was the message that people started to get. So that by November of 82, everything that was gained, particularly in the House, had been wiped away in the November 82 election. <laughs> That's what took place. And since this segment over here of the 45 was not really strong to begin with, the 20 or 25 who were weak broke and fled immediately embracing the liberal ranks, saying, look, we're glad to be back. We never really left you. Uh, you know you're, we're really on the team. You can trust us. Uh, good to be back in the fold. That caused the remaining 20 or 25 to panic, and the bow weevils today are just simply an interesting part of political history, but nothing more. And the potential shift that took place after the 82 uh, that temporarily caused this for six to eight months has now been reversed and is back this direction once again on the part of the iron filings. Now, <clears throat> to reverse this shift, you may be very disgusted that there are so many pure politicians in Washington. You should not be surprised. Talk to your friends and neighbors. Talk to the members of your club. Talk to the members of your family. Talk to the members of your church tomorrow. And find out how many people are really concerned. 
Find out how many people really have an understanding about what's happening. And you will find that maybe one out of 30, maybe one out of 50. Perhaps one person out of 30 can give you an accurate definition of inflation. That is the problem. So this is a very frustrating picture. And you begin to look at it and say, boy, this is hopeless. No, it's not. The solution for the short term, what we need to do in each two-year period, is to develop understanding at the local level. The problem is in the living rooms of America. The reflection of that problem is in the type of individuals that we send to Washington. If you're disgusted with what's happening in Washington, look to your neighborhoods, look to your friends and associates, because these are the individuals that make the selections for the type of people we send. Now, for the short term, in each election, you need to add another layer here and subtract another layer there because we are too far gone there is too much apathy and voter ignorance to be able to make a dramatic sweep and you're certainly not going to get the news media to go along to help you and explain to you what's going on you must build avenues of understanding outside of the news media and that's the key but if you do this you say well gosh that is a very small change it is sufficient because with that change, that center group will realize full well the direction. And in order to save their political skins, they will go back this way. And that is the large numbers of where the votes are. And each election, increase that and subtract that. And then this center group will continue uh, the direction. And this is, to me, the opportunity that we have. And Many people here will say, Congressman, it is hopeless. There are so many people on food stamps. There are so many people receiving a government subsidy that you cannot turn around this process. Do not worry about numbers. Yes, there are some bad numbers. But we're not in this mess because of bad numbers. Most people who are sloppy in providing for their families, most people who are sloppy in providing for their future are sloppy in their civic responsibilities as well. And we're in this mess because of good people who should know better. Uh, good people who should be honestly concerned are out to lunch, so to speak. And you can go to areas of affluent areas, of productive areas, of neighborhoods, and you look at the bumper stickers sometimes, and you will find that people who owe their whole life to free enterprise are frequently supporting politicians who are working to destroy the very values they say they represent organization is the key not numbers organization should be at three separate levels now those out in the back of the room perhaps can't see this it's very easy to follow it's just a presentation of the Parthenon on the Acropolis or standard uh, Greek type building the foundation columns and a roof the first level of activity is the most difficult it is the most frustrating it is by far the most important and that is the activity of building understanding at the grassroots level, building an informed electorate. Once you do this in a community, in a congressional district, it is then possible to get good people elected to Congress. Political action is the second level of activity. Now we are starting to develop a new leadership in Washington. We're starting to get some good Democrats and Republicans that can work together as a team to restore sound values. Uh, we have nowhere near the numbers necessary, but it is beginning. But you know, when you go to Washington as a strict constitutionalist, you're slapped in the face by the fact that the power and support from the left is enormous. You have the Ford Foundation, the Brookings Institute, the Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie Endowment for Peace, including Marxist groups such as IPS, Institute for Policy Studies. There are about 100,000 or so tax-exempt foundations, almost 200,000. Most of them politically are from the left side. There are just a handful working or supporting what you would term constitutional values. Tremendous support at this third level, uh, up until now, has been from the left. There needs to be 
and this may be done with tax-exempt money as a foundation, better support mechanisms, better image-making mechanisms, and informational mechanisms to help out hold together this emerging leadership and not only help here pull that together, this is made possible by strength here, but you're also able with tax exempt money to provide the educational tools to develop an informed electorate. Let's take the first and the third very quickly. The first level of activity, there are a number of different groups. So the John Birch Society, you have Conservative Caucus, you have the American Conservative Union, Young Americans for Freedom, and uh, perhaps the American Security Council. These are the sum of the groups working nationally uh, that are active at this first level. Now, I serve on the advisory board or the national board or leadership in all five, so I'm familiar with their pluses and minuses. Without question, the most effective group and really the only group that is organized and active at the grassroots level is the John Birch Society because it is the only one that has coordinators, has a paid field staff, and has active chapters working at the grassroots level. The uh, Birch Society has organized, the, let me say, the Conservative Caucus, Young Americans for Freedom, American Conservative Union, are all organized as an upside-down pyramid. If you are a member of these, you occupy this position at the apex at the bottom. And when you join, you may have a membership card, you may have some literature sent to you and so forth. But the real function as a member, when everything is said and done, is to answer your mail. That's it. Because periodically in the mail, you will receive a solicitation for money to help with a particular project. And the people who are handling sending you the mail have a contract that takes out somewhere between 60, 40, 60, 90, in some cases, 100% of the money sent in goes to the people who sent you the letter. <coughs> so that, say there's a particular project to save the Panama Canal, you really are concerned, so you send $1,000. Somewhere between 400, 600, 900, 000, 900 of those dollars will go to the person who sent you the letter. And only a fraction will go to the project that you're trying to support. You may argue that's very inefficient. They will argue that 40% of something is better than 100% of nothing. But your real function is to send money. And the headquarters group is usually in Washington, D.C. And it is from here that whatever work is done is then performed. And that uh, applies to almost every group in the United States today working to build more understanding at the grassroots level. The reason why the John Birch Society is so enormously effective, and the basic principles of these groups virtually are the same, the society is by far more of an educational army and points to the elitist groups that have been involved in the decision making of America's destiny, whereas that has been a touchy issue that the others have skirted. But in the last year or so, other groups have come in and said, yes, that's the answer, too. The society, the Birch Society, is organized as a traditional pyramid. The members are at this level, at the base. The leadership is in Massachusetts. Why they selected Massachusetts, I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they do their own fundraising, so there's no takeout fee. Any monies raised go for the projects involved. Members receive a monthly bulletin. And the key to the society is, and the reason why it's so enormously effective, it is organized by individual chapters in the communities that meet twice a month, carrying out the projects that are called for. Now, if any member doesn't want to do a project, it's against your conscience. I've been in for 20, over 20 years, I've never seen a project that was not in good taste and for absolutely worthy objectives, but if, the society makes it very clear. If you're ever asked to do something you don't agree with, just don't do it. But nevertheless, it is at the grassroots level that individual members are active. 
and thus the direction, the programs, are multiplied rather than contracted. So there's tremendous work being done on a volunteer basis at the local level. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the reason why so many of those who espouse totalitarian government, who have a fascination for more government and more control, are absolutely uh, frantic at the thought or the potential of the growth of the John Birch Society. Because it is the group that is organized at the grassroots level. And it is the group that they feel must be discredited because it's the most active group. And at the local level, you are also augmented by the Birch Society function of trim tax reform immediately. Well, the challenge that we have before us as Americans, the threat to our civilization, the encirclement of America through the Caribbean, up through Central America, the weakness of allies in Europe, question marks in the Middle East, question marks in Africa, the loss of Asia, as many Americans are now wondering, is it indeed too late? The challenge before us and the question that we might ask ourselves is how will this end? I think that the ultimate destiny, one way or the other, will be decided in this decade. Now, I've talked to a lot of groups, and yet a lot of people I see that, well, say, well, gosh, Congressman, it sure is tough, and uh, it's rough, but thank goodness I'm not going to have to face it. My children are going to have to face some tough choices. In case you have, in the past, espoused what I think is a rather cowardly view, uh, you may now relax and rejoice uh, that it will not be your children. You will face it. The people in this room will be the ones that will face the outcome or conclusion of the struggle that is now before us. And the crisis and opportunity that we have in the 80s to be able once again as Americans to be able to grant control of our destiny. But that outcome, how it will end, will depend upon you. The problem is in the living rooms. And uh, there is a tremendous need to upgrade the understanding in our communities, in our organizations. Now, if you are not active now in the building of an informed electorate at the local level. If you're not active in an organized way, not uh, an individual activity of once a month at the club, uh, standing up and saying, uh, we've got a bunch of fools in Washington and we need to cut spending and balance budget, <clears throat> that's not activity. That's just ventilating your own personality traits. But if you're truly concerned, and those who are active in an organized way, to them, I think, goes all the credit for turning this problem around. Now, if you're not active at this level, then you have no hope of aiding in the process of getting good people elected. This is the political action process. The challenge is not one of Democrats, it's not one of Republicans, it's a challenge to all Americans. The third level of activity was the reason why we founded Western Gold Foundation. Some background material, I think in the near future, we will have some evening meetings and we'll be able to show you some of the very exciting audiovisual programs that Western Gold now has. I think you'll see the value to them, the opportunities that they bring to schools, to churches, as well as to nationwide television. And you will find those to be extremely exciting programs. But we will be scheduling those on some future evening. But if you're not active at one of these three levels, let me ask you a question. What are you doing? Tonight, when you go home, test yourself. Take out a sheet of paper and take a pen or pencil and write up at the top of the page 1982. And write down what did you do in the year of 1982 to restore a constitutional republic limited government or restraints by law. What did you do to rebuild our free enterprise system to actively remove the shackles? I don't mean that you had a job. Uh, and I don't mean that you registered to vote and voted. I assume you did those. I do not mean that you paid your parking tickets. I assume you did those. But what did you do to actively restore these values that our grandparents, great-grandparents, forefathers worked to give us that we take for granted. 
that has made America such a wonderful place to grow up in. Most of us, if we're honest, if we're really honest, we wind up with a blank sheet of page. Now ask yourself, are you really satisfied with a blank sheet of page? With the American society being destroyed economically where your children will live in slavery just to pay your debts? Children of Rome, incidentally, wound up being taxed over 100% taxation. Some families sold their children in slavery just to pay the taxes. To give you an idea of how serious it became. And I'm not so sure that we're so far behind in the enormous burden that we're handing our bright young graduates today, saying, Merry Christmas, get a job, work hard, because you're going to pay the debts for the bills, for the monies that we have spent long ago. Lenin died in 1924, and before he died, he laid down the program for conquest, the first taking Eastern Europe second, the masses of Asia, and third, the encirclement of the last bastion of capitalism. We will not have to attack, he said. It will fall like an overripe fruit into our hands. Paraphrase and summarize, that was his plan. We have seen Castro coming to Cuba in a Soviet bastion 90 miles from our shores as a result of our State Department policies and our news media. We've seen an armed takeover and a Castroization taking place tonight on the island of Grenada. Through our government, make no mistake, through our government and our news media, we have now have a Soviet Cuban bastion in Central America and Nicaragua. The threats to expand to El Salvador, if El Salvador falls, Honduras will fall shortly after that, and we could see a solid red Central America up to the Rio Grande within three to four years. Now, just to give you a little measure of comparison, our national resources were strapped to the brink by handling 125,000 refugees from Cuba recently. How do you think it's going to be to handle 15 to 20 million people walking across the border with Mexico that is an over 2,000 mile border? Are you honestly prepared to machine gun down families, mothers and fathers carrying their children? with priests carrying their religious uh, relics in front of them as they walk across? This is the prospect you face. If you think Mexico is any bastion of strength, you're not, uh, you not, haven't been in the 20th century. You've certainly not done your homework. It is a rotten egg that's ready to be crushed, frankly, from within. It's a sad story, but it's a long story. Let me urge you to get involved. And I ask you, if you haven't been involved, what will it take? Do you have to wait until your child comes back from college twisted as a young hippie Marxist because of some smart Marxist professor that able to grab hold of the young brain and twist it like putty because they did not learn fundamentals, basic fundamentals in their home society, in their own high school? You have to wait until you lose a son in a no-win conflict, as in Korea or Vietnam, before you decide that you're involved. You have to wait until you lose your job due to inflation or government-caused inflation or high interest rates. You have to wait until you realize that your church is taking your offering money to support terrorist activities abroad, to burn missionaries and to burn uh, down missions. To some Americans, I think they will have to face some personal catastrophe before they're willing to face up to the fact that they are involved. I would urge you tonight to remember that organization is the key. From my own perspective, as your representative, as one who's active in a lot of areas, I would urge you to get active at your local level. Get active in an organization. To say I'm on the national boards of those I met listed and many others, but I strongly recommend at the local level, it's not a Democrat, it's not a Republican, it's not a political area, to get active in the local chapters of the John Birch Society because, in my opinion, it's the best way that honorable citizens, Catholic, Protestant, Jew, young, old, black, or white, can join together in a movement that does not endorse politicians does not endorse parties.
does not contribute to politicians or parties, but is working to build a renewed appreciation of the values of limited government, free enterprise, and biblical morality. We're here tonight facing this threat and the crisis that is upon us. But we're here still in a land of liberty, because in 1776, during that period of the initial phase of that first transition, 56 men came together in Philadelphia, signing a Declaration of Independence, pledging their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Despite a tremendous threat, in spite of some of them having their children stripped from them, being tortured and killed, families scattered, in spite of vast fortunes thrown to the winds and signers dying in poverty, unable to pay their debts, you know, not a single one of the 56 welched on that signature and pledge. In 1983, you have a much greater challenge than they do, in a much greater crisis. But you also have much more wherewithal, more time, more freedom, more leisure, more substance to put into the fight. I hope each and every one of you are willing to pledge just a portion of your time, a portion of your substance, but renew that pledge of your sacred honor so that your children and your grandchildren will be able to look back to this time and know that members of their family responded to the challenge. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two points of business. Uh, first of all, there will be a short question and answer period in just one moment. We also have the drawing for the color television set, which uh, Congressman McDonald will now draw for us. He didn't know that, but uh, <laughs> Larry, would you please bring it in? I know it's a hot night. You've been here a good while, and many people need to stretch and uh, get some fresh air, among other things, maybe some water. Uh, let's have a very short question and answer period. Any questions? Yes, sir. You have the curve with the congressman in the middle and the congressman in the corner. If you throw two names, that's no. Uh, the question is, you have a curve of a uh, horseshoe type thing of uh, congressmen uh, who are working to restore traditional values and those on the left. And remember, this is not a matter of extreme right versus extreme left. Uh, the news media would love to have you think that's the case. But what you're looking at, the fight is between those who espouse the traditional values that made this country, I think, made this country great. Maybe some people won't argue that. Some people in this audience won't argue that. The fight in Washington is between those who wish to restore a constitutional republic and those who are espousing some form of very far left form of government. In the sense that this is right, it is to the right of here. It's to the right of where we are. That's true. But it is not extreme right over in this ring. That's the difference. What you're looking at is those who espouse, frankly, at the midpoint of the spectrum versus the extreme left. There's probably only one member of Congress, I think maybe one and a half, that a view that the government should be to the right of this area. Uh, they, I think, are relatively insignificant. And I do not believe they would dare stand up before an audience and espouse that directly. Most people assume that they are in this group. But the fight is between those two. And the question is, he would like to throw out two names and have me assess those individuals as to where they stand or what camp they're in. This is uh, mentioned to you in the beginning. That's a subjective evaluation to start with. And it's not my role to go around pointing fingers and uh, giving absolution to this one and uh, condemning that person to uh, eternal damnation. That is your responsibility. And in judging 
politic politicians never judge a politician by their speeches or by their newsletters. Judge them only by their voting records and how they stand. That's the only thing that's going to affect your future. And in assessing those judgments, there are some political shortcuts that can be of great help. A lot of people say, well, gosh, Congressman, I don't have time to read the congressional record. Relax. Nobody in the world reads the congressional record. <laughs> it is like a telephone book. It is a reference. It is not something you read daily from cover to cover. It's a reference book. Understand that. But there are some shortcuts to understanding how your representative is doing. And there are some national groups that rate all members of Congress according to a political bias. All you need to know is what is it you want and what groups express your bias. Now, if you agree with the general presentation that I've given tonight, then there are five different rating groups that rate all members of Congress, and you should get their ratings. Those are the Review of the News rating. Review of the News magazine makes a rating about four times a year. And uh, many members of Congress think that is the most accurate rating. Even though it rates only about 40 or 50 votes per year, it is the one that most precisely identifies where a person is coming from. A rating here is the Committee for the Survival of Free Congress rating. It rates on about 300 votes per year. But it doesn't matter. It's almost identical with this one in terms of the outcome. The third group, American Conservative Union, uh, rates on about 10 or 20 votes per year, and it's very similar to these, not quite as tough. One of the oldest is Americans for Constitutional Action, and it rates on about 20 votes per year, and it's not very tough. It's not as accurate as it ought to be, in my opinion. It's a little sloppy in its ratings, but it's in the ballpark. And the fourth and the fifth group is the American Security Council rating. And that's the National Defense rating. This one rates solely on the basis of does this person vote for a strong national defense or not. And it, votes, it rates on about 10 or 20 votes every two years. And it's just like a child's report card. If you get a member that comes out this way, say he gets a cumulative rating on review of the news of 95, Freedom for Smile Free Congress, a cumulative rating of 88, American Conservative Union of 95, uh, American's Constitutional Action about 90, and uh, American Security Council of this, of 100. You don't even have to know how to pronounce that fellow's name. You can quickly sit down, you can write a very accurate summary of this individual. Say, this person's voting philosophy is towards traditional values, restoring the Constitution, restoring limited government, a free enterprise system of economics, and a strong national defense. That is one of your friends, if you believe in what I've tried to say tonight. Now, now if the rating comes out uh, 10, uh, 15, this would probably be about 20 in that case. Uh, this will be about 15. Uh, this ACA will be about uh, 20. And this will be about 10. That would be someone of uh, leftward, very far left, probably in the middle group, but very much of a left winger in the middle group. Now, if you had someone of zero, about 10, about five, about five or ten, and about zero to ten. This is someone in that uh, far left group working for a totalitarian socialist America. And you don't have to know how to spell the name. You don't have to know how to pronounce the name. And you don't have to listen to any explanations. You don't have to listen to any speeches. You can tell whether you're a friend or foe. The problem is that today, the people who really believe in America back home, do not know who their friends are in Washington and who their enemies are. That's why we have the mess that we have. Yes, sir. Do you have a question? 
Larry, we have here tonight uh, the president and founder of the Afghan Council on Freedom Organizations in America, Dr. Patrol, who lives in our area, and is his guest, uh, a freedom fighter, Abdul Rahim, directly from Afghanistan, who has been fighting over there. What can you say to them to help them understand our system in the light of your explanation here tonight that will give them some hope that uh, uh, they can preserve freedom over there? Well, the question is a very lengthy one dealing with uh, people who have been introduced from Afghanistan, including some freedom fighters from Afghanistan. I'm sure some of you won't come up and say hello to them afterwards and maybe get some comments or their expressions. I'm sure the people there are very frustrated because they feel like that the so-called free world is uh, not doing much to help the cause of freedom. And uh, that's true, and it's also true in many other areas of the world. It was true in Hungary, true in Czechoslovakia, and true in Poland today and other areas. The reason for this is that the, the dominating force in the West is really not seeking a victory over communism. It's seeking an accommodation with communism on the road to an objective of world government. The communists want world government too. Uh, the fight is between maybe the elitist and the radical world government, and which one would win, I don't know. But either way, you lose, I lose, the people of Afghanistan lose. And uh, we are losing segments of the free world. That has been the pattern of the 20th century. And that has been possible so often due to America's policies and our news media uh, protecting those policies. And ladies and gentlemen, that is only going to change when people like yourselves and people, let me say, when you, each and every one of you, roll up your sleeves and decide to do something about it. And I would urge you to once again be willing to make a pledge of a portion of your time, a portion, small portion of your resources but work in an organized way to restore our American system before it is too late. I scheduled this speech. I asked the people here, could I please come and make a speech? I'm not, uh, no honorarium, I don't want any payment, and the proceeds are going to go to a, a children's summer camp where they will be able to understand these values. I scheduled this speech, and I'll be working to try to make more of this type of presentation because I think at this critical time, this is one of my responsibilities to you. And if you don't do something about it, then it becomes your fault. You may remember in the chapter of Ezekiel, in one of the last chapters, I think 33, I believe, <clears throat> that uh, the Lord is making a reference of the watchman on the towers. That if uh, the evil, or if the villainy, or if the uh, war comes, and if the watchman does not sound the trumpet, then the blood is on the hands of the watchman. Any blood that's shed is on the hands of the watchman that goes to sleep. But if the watchman sounds the trumpet, if the watchman on the towers sound the trumpet, and the people are too lethargic, too asleep, too busy enjoying the good life to care, then the blood and the responsibility is on the hands of the people. And I'm going to do everything I can in the weeks and months ahead to come back and let you know that if you've been sleepy up until now, if you wind up each day and each night with a blank sheet of page, I am urging you to roll up your sleeves and do something about it before it's too late. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The program you just heard was recorded in Marietta, Georgia on June 3rd, 1983. Your speaker was the late Congressman Lawrence P. MacDonald of the 7th District of Georgia, who also served as chairman of the John Birch Society. Larry MacDonald was murdered by the communist criminals who run the Soviet Union, a tyrannical political system born of an earlier idealistic socialistic system of the type some Americans desire for this country. If, after listening to these tapes, you are perhaps still one of those who doesn't think socialism will lead to communism, Listen to these tapes again. Please feel free to duplicate these tapes to share with your friends. Thank you and pray for America.